Father, I come to you in Jesus' name, Lord. Just thank you for these fellows that have uh, taken their time out to come um, hear from you, God. And I say that specifically tonight, Lord, because I know I've, I've planned a little bit, but Lord, first time. So I just ask, God, that I'll get out of the way and, and um, anything that you've got to say will flow through me, that these fellows, uh, their time won't have been wasted and that they uh, walk out of with um, something that they got tonight. So. Just bless them, bless their families, and uh, we'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. So, um, yeah, so I've not done this before, so this is kind of interesting. Don't do uh, stand-up. Um, but um, for, so for a variety of one thing is doing this, I have a new appreciation for the pastors that do this on a weekly basis. Egal. So um, it's awesome. So um, anyway, we're in uh, Joshua chapter 8. And I'm going to go back, um, backtrack just a little bit on how we got here and then go into um, Joshua 8. And so I've always heard Achan was the sin problem and the reason um, for the initial defeat at Ai. However, Joshua too had a sin problem. While Achan committed an act of commission by stealing from God, Joshua committed an act of omission by not thanking God for the victory at Jericho, nor did he seek God for the instruction related to Ai that he had done for Jericho. And it was only after the defeat um, that he decided to seek God, who then made him aware of the sin in the camp. And we should use this as an example um, for ourselves as we see God's guidance and direction before we advance and do anything on our own. So when they finally realized that there was sin in the camp, and it was the main cause of the defeat, they took all the things and laid them before the Lord. Because as we know, Sin needs to be exposed and brought to the light for cleansing, and by so doing, um, the Lord can turn from the fierceness of his anger. <clears throat> we may think our sin, and especially our hidden sin, will not impact others. However, our sin does affect others. Just ask Achan, ask his family, ask um, because they had died because of his sin, ask the 3,000 soldiers that initially tried to take I the first time, uh, had to retreat, um, and then also the 36 soldiers that, that died on that, on that first approach. And so the life lesson here is, is don't be fooled, all sin has a cost. Um, and another thing, if you think Joshua, if he had gone to God and given thanks for the victory at Jericho and inquired of God on how to take um, I, I think God would have probably said, hey dude, you might not want to do that, you got an issue in the camp. Um, and that was again part of the issue. Um, Instead of going to God, uh, he, um, in his arrogance and perhaps pride, and then listening to, to his men rather than God, he's, they decided to send up just a small amount of men to take I, and as we know, their first attempt uh, failed miserably. Um, and a conclusion to repentance and the forgiveness process with God is this. He will turn from the fierceness of his anger, and we will once again be in an unbroken relationship with him. Be a righteous man. After failure, repent, then rise up and walk. Proverbs 25, 26 says, For a righteous man will fail seven times and rise again, but the wicked fail or fall by calamity. Joshua chose to rise again, while Achan chose calamity. So now we get into Joshua 8, and we're picking it up, um, and they're in prayer. And it says, Now the Lord said to Joshua, Do not be afraid, nor be dismayed. Take all the people of war with you and rise. Go up to Ai. See, I have given, you, I have given into your hand the king of Ai, his people, his city, and his land. So when I read this the first time initially, I thought, why would Joshua still be in prayer? Hadn't God already said, I've turned from my anger. You know what I've told you before. Go. Um, but then I realized Joshua, he needed affirmation. And he was awaiting a fresh revelation and a confirmation and instruction um, about God's will and what to do next. And in 2 Timothy 1.7 it said, God has not given us a spirit of fear, but a power of love and a sound mind. I think Joshua still at this point was a little fearful of, and perhaps rightly so, of, of where he should go and what he should do. Um, but then he's reminded, do not be dismayed, I mean, do not be afraid nor dismayed. These are words designed for all the people, not just Joshua. I get the sense here um, that, that Joshua is not being told this 
on his own because the people of war were with him um, because they too were seeking consolation and counsel from the Lord because if you look at verse 3, we get to a place where it says all the people arose, which gives me a thought that they were all there. And, and I would imagine if their leader's praying, they're probably playing, praying as well. Um, so they were clearly waiting to hear from God, and then clearly now they got his instructions because they said, take all the people, arise, go up to I. And the, so the servant of God must not follow his own path. Rather, he must seek counsel of God continually following his instruction. Only then will we be justified in counting upon his blessing and his protection. And then sometimes after a failure, sin or hurting someone, we need to know and be reminded by God that after repentance, he is no longer angry with us, and through forgiveness, the relationship with him is restored. I do not think we always remember this, and then we also have an enemy that would prefer us to walk continually in guilt and shame, because in that we're defeated. So then God told jo Joshua, arise. He was ready for Joshua to move in order that he may take and receive the inheritance God had previously given him. And we can see that in Joshua 3, 9 and 10. And am I going, I'm sorry, am I going too fast? Because I'm, okay, I'm sorry. Um, but we had seen previously in Joshua 3, 9 and 10, way before, it says, um, so Joshua said to the children of Israel, come here, hear the words of the Lord your God. And Joshua said, by this you shall know the living God is among you, and that he will without fail drive out before you the Canaanites, the Hittites, and the Hivites, and the Perizzites, and the Girgashites, and the Amorites, and the Jebusites. And then even earlier than that, in Deuteronomy 11, 9, and 10, um, even before probably talking to Moses, he said, therefore you shall uh, keep every commandment which I command you today, that you will be strong and go in and possess the land which you cross over to possess, and that you may prolong your days in the land which the Lord swore to give you, to give your fathers, uh, to them, their descendants, it's a land flowing with milk and honey. So we even have here, again, going back, they're still in prayer, he's been told all along, you got it, you got it, you got it. So they just need to continue to walk in the victory that the Lord has already told them they would have and the blessing of the promised land which they've already been promised. So when Joshua hears, I have given, this, I have given into your hands the king of Ai, his people, and his land, he is receiving a word of encouragement, a word of remembrance, a word of instruction, and a word of promise for faith to take hold on. <clears throat> Thankfully, God is still even with us in the encouragement business, and he'll find each of us um, and remind us to get up and continue our journey after a fall. And then God, too, is reminding Joshua and the people of, <clears throat> of the promises he had made previously. The cities, the promised land, are Israel's for Israel's taking. Even though God keeps his promise, sometimes we can get in the way of those promises and those blessings. And this is evidenced in Joshua 5 and 6. And if you remember, they had to wander around in the wilderness for a little while for being disobedient. It says, For the children of Israel walked 40 years in the wilderness. <clears throat> that light is brutal. Till all the people who were, all the people who were men of war, who came out of Egypt, were consumed because they did not obey the voice of the Lord, to whom the Lord swore that he would not show them the land which the Lord had sworn to their fathers that he <clears throat> would give them, a land flowing with milk and honey. So for, and you guys remember that, they sent the, the spies in and a couple came back and that's why Joshua was still hanging around because he and Caleb were the only two that came back with the, looking through God's eyes, not people's eyes, and said, Moses, we got this. The others got to walk around for 40 years and didn't get to see the promised land. So Matthew Henry says it this way. When we, faithfully, when we have faithfully put away sin, that accursed thing which separates us from God, then and not till then may we expect to hear from God for our comfort in God's direction, or directing us how to go on our Christian walk, and warfare is a good evidence of his being reconciled to us. So God says, I have given this into your hand because victory is already won. This is yet another occurrence 
to, uh, encouragement to Joshua, Joshua, go. I got this. And then 1 Corinthians 15, 57. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through the Lord Jesus Christ. When we accept and follow God's rules and instructions, there is no uncertainty in victory. Mistakes can ground us. They can keep us, moving, they can keep us from moving along in our mission. And like Joshua and Israel, we need to, we need to know we have been restored to, to God's favor, counting on him to lead us to victory. The enemy, on the other hand, would like us to live in our past failures as it keeps us from the battle that we have in front of us now. Conversely, God wants us back in the battle, living in his promises. So hear the word, believe, repent, and for, be forgiven. In other words, while we are blamable for failure, once we repent and confess to God, we are able to walk out faith in victory, renewing the contest with the enemy. When iniquities have prevailed against me, that's Psalm 65.3, and the enemy has humiliated me, we may be prone to being swallowed up with too much sorrow, 2 Corinthians 2.7, allow, allowing Satan to keep me in the depths of despair, which is not only needless and foolish, but dishonoring to God. He who covers this sin will not prosper, but whoever confesses and forsakes them will, be, will have mercy. Proverbs 28, 13. So we're remembering this. He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So we spend a lot of time, that's just verse 1. Some of the later ones go a little quicker because um, that one, sometimes it takes a while for us to get going, especially if we've blown it. You got to be encouraged over and over again. Have three or four brothers come back and say, you're all right, get it done, get back in the game, blah, 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 and you're still... No, no, no. Um, so there's all kinds of words from God in here that we should take encouragement from to say, you know, he'll, he'll cleanse us from our unrighteousness. Our relationship's unbroken. We've got no excuse to, but, but to, to, to get, get active. Verse 2. And you shall do to I and the king as you did to Jericho and its king. Only its spoil and its cattle you shall take as booty for yourselves lay an ambush for the city behind it. So the children of Israel, they're assured victory after a defeat. They're also assured of the reward of spoil, just as God has promised. They are ultimately given grace, victory, and provision. Then I'm thinking about Achan. If only he had waited for God's perfect provision. <laughs> Instead, he tried to meet his own needs and desires in his own way, and it cost him, cost him dearly. He broke a first fruit principle. Jericho was the Lord's. Achan stole from God. If he had waited, probably perhaps less than a week, because Jericho and I and Bethel, they were real close from, from a marching standpoint, um, he would have been blessed and shared in God's complete provision that he shared with Israel, um, the children of Israel, at the defeat of Ai. So the irony in all this is the stuff that he, that he, had, <laughs> that he had stolen, he couldn't even enjoy it. He had to put it under his tent. And I'm imagining not only was it under his tent, could he not use it and play with it and see it and stuff, but it's under, because it was under his tent. You just don't get under your tent and pick something up real quick. It's under your tent, right? So, um, and I also imagine that he was living in fear about being exposed and probably walking around guilty, knowing it had stolen what belonged to God. Not a great place to be. Um, and then the sad thing in all that is, besides the fact that he lost his life, the only one who mattered knew already, and could have forgiven him if only he'd repented. We should always wait on the Lord for his best, relying on his promises and provision, knowing we never lose by waiting on God's timing. So then he starts in verse 2. This is when he's going to start with, this is, this is, a, this is how we're going to go take I. He says, God says, lay an ambush uh, for the city behind it in verse 2. So Joshua was to act in faith, walking in complete obedience to God's instructions. We should remember our confidence is this, Philippians 1.6, being confident in this very thing that he 
who has begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Verse 3. So Joshua arose and all the people of war to go up against Ai, and Joshua chose 30,000 mighty men of valor and sent them away by night. When Joshua sent these people, they arose, they were now acting in collective obedience as well as faith, prepared to obey, to obey further instructions. While God had given them victory, it did not negate the reality of them having an active part to play in God's plan. Life lesson. Faith is no substitute for diligent and zealous work, as we all have a participation obligation. Ultimately, true faith produces good works, and those works are to be, to be performed in the spirit of dependence upon the Lord. Ephesians 2, 8, 9, and 10, which you guys, most of you probably know, for by grace you are saved through faith, and that not of yourself. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, creating Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So hope does not, abs does not absolve us from obligation. So while the fall of I was certain, Israel still had to strap it on and do battle. God does not give his, give his people assurance of victory so we can get lazy and not participate in his plans. Rather, his assurances are to excite and encourage our diligent participation. We should remember our labor is not in vain in the Lord. From 1 Corinthians 15, 58. Verse 4. And he commanded them, saying, Behold, you shall lie in ambush against the city, behind the city. Do not go very far from the city, but of all of you, be ready. Because God's plans are not necessarily our own, Joshua instructs these mighty men of valor, kind of interesting, mighty men of valor, and he's about to tell them to go hide, um, to hide behind the city in ambush. God's ways are often different and mysterious, which should keep us alert and interested. At Jericho, they do little militarily and just march around the city, but for I, they are to take an active part militarily, though the mighty men are initially told to lie in ambush behind the city. While God's plans here are different, the people obey in keeping with God's instructions. So they've learned something. They're, they're being obedient this time. Finally, those who lie in ambush are told to be ready. We will see in verse 18, they finally get their signal to move, and because they're actively watching and waiting, they are ready. Like them, we should be actively watching and waiting to follow God's plan as well. Verse 5, Then I <clears throat> and all the people who are with me will approach the city, and it will come about when they come up, when they come out against us as at the first, that we will flee before them. God keeps his word, so when we read, it will come about, we can trust his plan to unfold just as he revealed it through Joshua. We also see here that Joshua is now using I's previous experience and self-confidence against them when he says, everyone in I will come out as at the first. Joshua will flee, and he'll be chased, leaving the city vulnerable. Joshua is relying on God's plan as he instructs and leads his people. Kind of a little sidebar there. I'm thinking of, of football with a defensive back, Baton and Baton and Baton, a receiver jumps around, does a pick six. So they're kind of being tricked here. So I kind of find that, that interesting and just, it's like, gotcha. So at the first here is interesting as far as words are concerned. On one hand, God is using a past failure of his people to teach and to give a new opportunity of victory, while on the other, he is using I's initial, initial victory over his people against themselves. We know our enemy also wants to use our failures to keep us from making it, from, to keep us in fear, making it difficult to walk out our faith. <clears throat> ultimate purpose and faith and ultimate purpose for our life. Um, what will we choose? Are you gonna choose a life lesson? Or are you gonna choose fear? and defeat. Romans 8.28 says, And we know all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. 
not to make light of sin, but when we, re when we recall or reminded of our past sin, mistakes, and fears, we should be, dis we should be encouraged that get God, God can use them to help encourage ourselves and others. This isn't to say, sometimes you hear people give testimonies like, I used to do this, and I used to do that, and I used to do this, and I used to do that. Isn't that a great testimony? Almost sounding like, I used to be such a bad guy. Isn't that cool? Um, those testimonies are great, and we can get to people differently when we have those. Um, but you've got to be careful not to be prideful in that. Share when you're led to share, but sometimes your past is best left in the past. Because some people are like, isn't that a great testimony? My preference for a testimony would be somebody getting up and said, I've, you know, I've never cheated, I've never stole anything, I've never cursed, I've never slept around, I've never done this, I've waited till marriage. That to me is a good testimony, not the person saying, God got me and I did all this crazy stuff. I'd rather hear the other one because you may be forgiven, but there are people that are going to take all your stuff to the cross, but you still have baggage, you got stuff to carry. Um, I'd rather personally have had the first route. I'll just, I'll take that for me. I don't know, I don't know what you guys would prefer. So, verse 6, for they, they will come out after us till we draw them away from the city, and they will say, they are fleeing before us as at the first, therefore we will flee before them. Face conclusion as seen in Joshua is this, because Joshua was employing the means which the Lord had appointed Resting in his promises from verse 1, he had the utmost confidence in the successful outcome of his plan. He could count upon God's blessing of drawing the enemy out from the city, leaving it unprotected. A life lesson. Through God's word, we are given knowledge of the enemy's policy and tactics. The knowledge should be turned to good use, otherwise we fail to profit from God's revelations. In 2 Corinthians 2.11, lest Satan should take advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. Verse 7. Then you shall rise from the ambush and seize the city, for the Lord your God will deliver it into your hands. Notice it's God who delivers, because apart from God, we can do nothing. John 15, 5. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me, and I in him, <coughs> bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. So God has revealed through Joshua the promise of victory while giving him uh, more and more of the plan. Similarly, the power of his might gives us victory. Remember, our enemy has been defeated. God delivers on his promises and encourages us along the way. Following God's plans and instructions are the only path to victory. Success of a plan requires the full cooperation of Joshua's men. <clears throat> While all the men had different roles and responsibilities, each was responsible to play their part faithfully. When the Lord's people are called to act together as part of one body, we are not given the same tasks to perform, nor positions of equal honor. We are called to work together as the complete body of Christ to complete our master's tasks. So that reminds me of, I was playing uh, racquetball with a brother here, Felix, two years ago probably now, and I had a problem where I pretty much tore my calf a little bit. I was done. So um, it's fixed mostly now, but I remember for golly, what seemed like a month, it took me an hour to get everywhere. I sweat all the time. Um, it was tedious work, just like being on first impressions, I couldn't do anything, right? It's like, Jim, can you come? I'll be there in an hour, right? It just wasn't working. Um, it, 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 remind, it reminded me of, of this verse. I mean, who would have thought I wanted to be a calf muscle? But my calf muscle was shot. I had nothing. So I was reminded every piece of our body is important, similarly to here. Um, we may each think, well, I only do this or I only do that. Well, if you didn't do that, that may be a, uh, an issue. So, um, and kind of a story from the, from the build out. The night PD first stood on the stage, there was a handful of us. I think Carson was under, 
under the stage doing stuff because we were trying to get, I think Joel might have been under the stage that day and, and um, I know Sheldon was under the stage because we knew PD wanted to speak that night. The church wasn't open, he was just gonna talk to you know, 150 people that were doing the build out. And so we were trying to rush, rush, rush and get it. And you know, I didn't love being underneath there and I'm sure the other guys weren't thinking this is the best ever because you know, every time you turn around you were, hitting an, uh, you were hitting a screw, poking a hole in yourself. But the cool thing was, right, that's what I had to do that night. That's what we were all doing that night. And I was reminded when, when I came back and was watching PD stand, he was standing on our backs. And I don't mean that in a negative way, but we were supporting him in what he's called to do, which is teach, talk, and that kind of thing. And so there wouldn't have been, on that evening, eight people underneath there trying to finish that up. He wouldn't have been talking from the stage that night. So I'm just reminded, that was kind of a story that I was reminded of when I was looking at this, but I thought that was pretty cool. The bridge has success when collectively as the body of Christ we support our pastor as the head in fulfilling those tasks we have been called to accomplish both collectively and individually. If we lack unity, there is no united front presented before our enemy and we will not capture our eye. 1 Corinthians 12, 18 through 22, but now God has set members, each one of them in the body as he pleased, as he pleased, not we pleased. Um, and if you were and if they were all one member, where would the body be? But now, indeed, there are many members, yet one body. And the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the hand to the feet, I have no need of you. No, much rather, those members of the body which seem to be weaker are necessary. And then 1 Corinthians 12, 27 and 28. Now you are the body of Christ and members individually and God has appointed these in the church, first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, after that miracles, then gifts of healing, helps, administrators, varieties of, of tongues. And then a question for each of us, and it goes back to my, um, kind of my calf story, if we're all part of the body, um, are, you, are you part of our problem and why we might have a limp. Because we all have a part. And it will be, verse 8, and it will be when you have taken the city that you shall set the city on fire according to the commandment of the Lord you shall do. See, I have commanded you. So it wasn't going to be enough for them just to take the city. It had to be reduced to ashes. And we should not relax until uh, in performing our tasks as, as instructed by God until a given task is complete. God grants us success as we continue to walk in complete obedience. This knowledge should encourage us <clears throat> to attempt even greater things for his name, or in his name. And his victory is one when we, <clears throat> victory is one who we should be excited that God graciously gives us gifts and abilities so we may work with him. According to the commandment of the Lord, they are to follow his instructions and so should we. Verse 9, Joshua therefore uh, sent them out, and they went, to, they went to lie in ambush and stayed between Bethel and Ai on the west side of Ai, but Joshua lodged that night among the people. So the men here demonstrate um, uh, an attitude and a spirit of faith, trust and loyalty, and they complied and didn't give any ob objections. Because again, these are, are men of valor and they're just told, you just go away for a little bit. Um, and what example for us as we too are asked to walk by faith and not by sight in roles which we may feel beneath us at, at the time or perhaps not our calling. And um, most of my little stories go back to the church build. So I remember Carson and I, well, I can't remember that other fellow's name that was kind of um, bald-headed fella. I don't remember his name, Derek. So they wanted me to use a blowtorch, right? I had to do with a hammer, let alone a blowtorch. So they're like, oh yeah, you'll be good, you'll be good. And the whole time I was thinking, I'm gonna blow up PD's church, right? Um, but what's cool is, I don't know if I could do, <laughs> I could do it again, but I've done, I did something that I'd never done. I learned something. I don't wanna mess with a blowtorch ever again. Um, I like to watch people do stuff with it. Um, but again, 
that was, that was stretching me, right? And in the build out, if you looked at everybody was, that was there, all of us were probably being stretched either, either for time because we had a job and a family and we were here or we took some time off from work and we were here. Um, so even if you were doing things that were normal for you, um, what was abnormal is maybe you were doing it for nothing, or you're doing it for God, but you were doing it for nothing, you were spending time here and, and I would imagine if we had talked to people out there, they would be like, you guys are crazy, right? Um, but we were all here happily making sacrifices so this place could get built so we could bring people in. And then one other thing, and I've talked to Carson about this before, it's not, quote, a spiritual gift, but it's kind of mine um, and others, the gift of availability. If you're not available, I don't care what gifts you got. If you're not available, you got nothing. So um, be available. Acts 1.8, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all... Oh, hold a second. Uh, yeah. Oh, so Joshua sent them out. Yeah, so that's okay. So, but, but you shall be, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, and in Judea, and Samaria, and in the ends of the earth. So we are all witnesses to the ends of the earth. So just like Joshua was sending his soldiers out. So too, Jesus sends us out to be witnesses in the ends of, to the ends of the earth. And when I was thinking about this, I kind of chuckled because we're kind of sent out, if we're working in the workforce, we're lying in ambush and unaware to people, and we should always be ready to, to give an account for the hope that lies within us because you can't necessarily just walk around work with your Bible open and just slapping people up and down one side or the other so I'm, I'm thinking to myself, I got it in my back pocket, so if somebody asks me, I can hit them up. So I kind of got a chuckle thinking that, that in the world, we're, we're, we're kind of in a place of ambush as well. A life lesson. As long as the leader is following God in accordance with the word, we are to follow that leader in obedience to God. So in verse 10, Joshua rose up early in the morning, mustered the people, and he went up, he and the elders of Israel before the people, <clears throat> to I. Joshua, as the leader, rose up early to make sure things were in order for battle. He mustered his people, putting them in the correct places um, for a successful engagement. Success requires intentionality. The elders, too, had joined him in encouraging the troops, getting them set for battle as well. Um, this was a military endeavor, so I envision that he was making sure that the soldiers were fully equipped for battle. We need to be ready for battle as well and she be mentoring and encouraging others for that battle. Ephesians 6, 13 through 17. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the, withstand in the evil day and having done all, to stand. Stand, therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness and having shod your feet with a preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, take the shield of faith <coughs> with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. So we should all be, in, you know, we all need to do that individually, and then we need to be mentoring people to do that as, as well. Verse 11 And all the people of war were with him went up, and they drew near. And they came before the city and camped on the north side of Ai. Now a valley lay between them and Ai. So he took about 5,000 men and set them in ambush between Bethel and Ai on the west side of the city. And I find it interesting here, if you go back and look, there's a verse in Genesis 12 eight. so they're lying in ambush getting ready to take Ai. Well, guess where, Josh, guess where Abraham got his call? in Genesis 12, 8, and he moved, and we'll talk about it later in the chapter, and he moved there from the mountain east of Bethel, and he pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and I on the east. There he built an altar to the Lord and called the name 
and called on the name of the Lord. So years and years and years before, he got called. Later on, he was told, you're going to get the promised land, all the stuff around you're going to see, and then a long time from then, they get it. I thought that was kind of interesting. Verse 13. When they had set the people, all the army that was on the north side of the city in its rear guard on the west of the city, Joshua went that night into the midst of the valley. There's no coincidence um, that I was unaware of the troop movement. Even though in verse 4 we were told they were not far from the city, their strategy relied on being unprotected while moving massive numbers of troops into position. This is a striking illustration of God's dominion over all and his full control even of the wicked. God is the restraining influence upon the wicked and this world for the good of his people. In today's world, I don't think we are quite aware of that enough, and I also don't believe we're using the power of prayer as a tool for his restraining influence. Verse 14. Now it happened when the king of Ai saw it that the men of the city hurried and rose early and went out against Israel to battle. He and all his people at an appointed place before the plain, but he did not know that there was a, an ambush against him behind the city. So the king finally um, sends out his entire army, leaving it defenseless um, because he was in haste thinking that, I got this, this is going to be easy. And, and Psalm 10.4 says, The wicked is, in his proud confidence does not seek God. God is, is in none of his thoughts. And in Proverbs 21 one says, the king's heart is in the hand of the Lord. Like the rivers of water, he turns it wherever he wishes. Um, <laughs> so we had no... T- <laughs> he was going to be a loser regardless of what he did. So um, the appointed place had been decided. The king could not escape God's timing or the plan as evidenced by the words, now it happened and at the appointed place. In Scripture... The words, now it happened, indicate something more than an introduction to some narrative. The words instead speak to the beginnings of an event which will demonstrate God's divine will and his control. If you remember, we saw God in verse 11 um, say, I have given. In verse 5, it will come about. In verse 9, it will be. And in this verse, um, now it happened in an appointed place all of which demonstrate God's control. By all these words, we know God has orchestrated everything, demonstrating nothing is left to chance with God. Verse 15. And Joshua and all Israel, made as it were, made as if they were beaten before them, and fled by the way of the wilderness. Sometimes what God asks us to do may seem odd and even humbling. As we see Joshua... He was not ashamed to lead a retreat as it was his instruction. If they were going to be victorious, why were they retreating? However, as they fled the wilderness, the way was prepared for others to accomplish the task God had given them. A life lesson here. There is no shame in following Christ, his word, and his example. Psalm 37, 34. Wait on the Lord and keep his way and he shall exalt you to inherit the land. When the wicked are cut off, you shall see it. And then in Isaiah 55, 9, For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. Another interesting thing that popped out to me, we hear Joshua is the type of Christ um, in the Hebrew Scriptures. Um, He's conquering by an act of yielding. Jesus, too, did this, when he bowed his head, choosing to give up his spirit, when it looked like the enemy had won, the resurrection demonstrates death was conquered and victory over sin was complete. John 19.30, he said, It is finished. Bowing, bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. Because of his victory over death and payment for sin, we can live this victory if we choose to believe and put our trust in him. John 11.25 and 26, And Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life, who believes in me, though he, were, though he may die, he shall live. And who, whosoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Luke 20, 36. Nor can they die any more, 
for they are equal to the angels and are sons of God, being sons of the resurrection. Verse 16. So all the people were an eye, were called together to pursue them. And they pursued Joshua and drawn away from the city. There was not a man left in Ai or Bethel who did not go out after Israel. So they left the city open and pursued Israel. Notice while there was not a man left in Ai or Bethel, they left of their own free will. This demonstrates we too have a free will, but God, um, we have a free will, and God's, that while we have a free will, God's invincible operations are at work. God draws irresistibly without violating man's conscience or his free will. God draws, draws both the believer and the unbeliever. We get to decide and are each accountable for the decisions we make. You want the easy button or the hard button? Verse 18. Then the Lord said to Joshua, Stretch out the spear that is in your hand toward I, for I will give it into your hand. And Joshua stretched out his spear that was in his hand towards the city. And the Lord instructing Joshua to stretch out his hand here toward I is very similar to Moses when Moses was told to stretch out his rod of God when they were fighting against Amalek. And he did that in Exodus 17, 11. And he said, when Moses held up his hand, that the Israelites prevailed, and when he let it down, Amalek prevailed. And at this time, I'm wondering if maybe Joshua was trying to follow Moses' example while remembering that earlier he had been told in Joshua 1, 5, no man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life, as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you, nor forsake you. Joshua, in obedience, stretched out his spear, not letting it down, until verse 26, when, when he had utterly destroyed all the inhabitants of Ai. In each stage of the process, the capture and destruction of Ai must be ordered by the Lord if they were to have success. We should ask, trust, obey, follow, rinse, and repeat. Uh, verse 19. So those in ambush arose quickly out of their place. They ran as soon as he stretched out his spear, and they entered the city and took it and hurried to set it, the city on fire. So the people in ambush arose quickly um, because they were actively waiting and watching for their signal to join the battle, remembering that they were told in verse 4, um, be ready. Sometimes we need to actively watch while we are waiting for our signal to join in the battle, or we may miss our calling. Luke 12, 40. Therefore, you also be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not, re do not expect. Verse 20. And when the men of Ai looked around, or looked behind them, they saw, and behold, the smoke of the city ascended to heaven, so they had no power to flee <clears throat> this way or that, and the people who fled to the wilderness turned back on their pursuers. So the men of Ai, they look back, and um, <laughs> in like chapter 7, they threw all common sense to the wind, but now they're looking back and realizing that they're in, in deep trouble, and um, they lost all power. And who can stand against the power and the will of God? There is a big difference between the first and the second attempt to take I. Unlike the first attempt, this time God was with Israel. And they were following his lead. Even more important, perhaps, the sin that was in the camp had been dealt with. And as such, Israel, this time, was in right standing with God, allowing him to be with them, allowing God to be with them. And then once before, and people don't sometimes learn by example, um, when, they were, when Moses was leading them, in Numbers 14, 41 through 45, and Moses said to the people, Now why do you tra transgress and, and uh, the command of the Lord? For this will not succeed. Do not go up, lest you be defeated by your enemies, for the Lord is not among you. For the Amalekites, the Canaanites, are there before you, and you shall fall by the sword, because you have turned away from the Lord. The Lord will not be with you. 
but they presumed, similar to Joshua presuming he could go take Ai the first time, but they presumed to go up to the mountaintop. Nevertheless, neither the Ark of the Covenant nor Moses departed from the camp. Then the Amalekites and the Canaanites who dwelt in the mountain came down and they attacked them and drove them back as far as Hormah. Life lesson experience should not necessarily be our best teacher. Sadly, sometimes it's the only way we learn. Last verse. Romans 8.31 What shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us?